Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. I hope you're having an amazing day so far and I hope your weekend went freaking awesome as well, that you did any chores you needed to do. I hope you spent some time with loved ones and just had a laugh. I just hope you were happy over the weekend. And if you weren't happy, I'm hoping this video today or one of the videos today puts a little grin on your chin because you deserve to be happy. It doesn't matter who you are, everybody deserves a bit of happiness. So I hope you had a bit of it on the weekend. Um, today we are reacting to what foods did the Americans eat during the Revolutionary War? Now, I'm quite interested to see this because if you've seen any videos on my channel before, you will know that I love food. I'm quite the foodie, not in that posh sort of way who wants to go to Michelin star restaurants and eat a morsel of food that will literally not fill me up at all. But I, I will try anything. I love trying food. I love trying new foods. And I, try I did exactly that on the weekend. Uh, now, obviously, I've eaten burgers before, but it's very rare that I've actually made homemade burgers and cooked them on the grill. And I watched a video uh, where the guy gave an awesome recipe, really good recipe, and I followed it along. And I tell you what, they turned out freaking awesome. My missus, who doesn't like burgers, actually had two um, throughout the day, not in one seating. And I had four in one seating, <laughs> sitting. I ate four burgers. I was so full. I didn't eat any sides with it or anything. I just ate burgers because they were so good. And then yesterday, Sunday, I tried to slow cook a uh, joint of beef. Uh, sorry, a joint of pork on the barbecue. I didn't mention it in yesterday's video because I didn't want anyone to ask me in case I absolutely failed. And I did fail in a way it probably could have done with a few more hours on the barbecue, but we were so hungry. It was cooked. It was ready to go. It was just not as tender as I wanted it to be. Um, but it was st it was still delicious. It was still delicious. But yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So yeah, but before we get into today's video, if you guys haven't done so already, please make sure you hit the subscribe button. And if you're feeling extra frisky, you may as well hit the like button as well. I do have a Patreon and a Buy Me A Coffee link down in the description if anyone wants to help out the channel. That will be freaking awesome. And without further ado, let's get into what foods did, Amer did Americans eat during the Revolutionary War. Although it may sound strange at first, the denizens of Revolutionary Era America often used food to express their anger at the British. From the Boston Tea Party to the coffee riots, Americans would use food to declare their independence. Meals and ingredients associated with the British were rejected and replaced with homegrown alternatives. Yeah. Today, we're going to take a look at some of the foods. Just a quick note on that. I think we should be doing that now anyway. Everyone loves to get a bit of an exotic food and that going on. But I think if we all took a little bit of responsibility, if we have the space and the, and the availability to grow our own food or raise at least a couple chickens or rabbits. I raise meat rabbits. I think it definitely helps, you know, and, and it tastes so much better. I think everyone should do it like it would make us less reliant on all these imports that we're getting. That's just my two cents. As Americans ate during the Revolutionary War. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us Great know channel, in the comments well. below what other Consult culinary to topics well. you would like to hear about. Okay, we hope you brought your patriotic appetite. Hold on. Noodle French style salad, shrimp mayonnaise dressing, fried, spring chicken. That looks pretty good. I was expecting some not so usual food during Tight. the war. We have some wonderful menu items for you today. Love blood pudding. I love it. Food was a valuable commodity during the revolution, so Americans were sure to use every part of the animal, even the blood. Take, for example, the recipe for blood pudding from an 1805 cookbook by Hannah Glass. The directions call for mixing cornmeal with boiled milk or, failing that, water. Next, blood is stirred in and the whole thing is mixed thoroughly. Finally, Glass recommends adding a molasses-based syrup called treacle and, for good measure, a little hog's lard. Cooks were advised to boil the blood pudding for up to seven hours before serving it. Seven hours? I didn't know it took that long. I've always just bought blood pudding like sausages. Uh, we get them here in Slovakia, and I actually really do like them. There's nothing wrong with it. I know some people are like, eh, I love it. I love offal as well, like liver, heart, kidneys, uh, tripe, the cow stomach. I love all that stuff. Boiled ox liver. When we said that Americans steak. during the revolution used every part of the animal, we meant it. Take, for example, Joseph Plum Martin, a private from Connecticut who recorded some of the more unusual foods he ate during the war. For example, on one occasion, he boiled an old ox's liver. It probably seemed like a good idea at the time, but it wasn't. Martin reports the meat gave him a terrible stomach ache. After taking some medicine, Martin, in his own words, discharged the hard chunks of liver <laughs> like grape shot from a field piece, which sounds just awful. And 
I shouldn't laugh, but I'm going to use that as... I'm just going to go discharge. That's so gross. Every conceivable way. <laughs> the way he said... To think an incident like oh. that would make Martin pickier about what he ate. But you no, can't. sir. Not for that Connecticut private. <laughs> Martin seemed to be especially fond of bits that, even then, others thought of as undesirable. This is illustrated in journals where, among other things, he also records eating a sheep's head so it wouldn't go to waste, and an ox's milt, or spleen, which made him hurl. <laughs> Nothing wrong with head. Ice cream? As anyone who has seen Hamilton could tell you, as soon as the American Revolution ended, Thomas Jefferson went to France. While he was there, the American founding father may have, for the first time in his life, tasted something many of us take for granted. Ice cream. First, yes, oh, wow. from the first moment he tried it, the dessert became a huge favorite with Jefferson. He's even the first American to create and popularize his own recipe for the stuff. As President of the United States, Jefferson is known to have served ice cream on at least six occasions. <laughs> Manasseh Cutler, a congressman from Massachusetts who Jefferson introduced to ice cream, wrote of the experience, Ice cream, very good. Crust wholly dried. Crumbled into thin flakes. Sounds like a review from a caveman. Imagine being like, I'm not a big sweetie person. I do like an ice cream every now and then, but I, I, you take it for granted. Imagine never having tried it. And then you try this freezing cold, sweet, creamy. It must've been an awesome experience. I mean, we take it for granted. I, I can't remember the first time I had ice cream. Ice cream, very good. Must've been Crust awesome. Crust dried. Crumbled into thin flakes. <laughs> Another White House guest marveled at the balls of the frozen material enclosed in covers of warm pastry exhibiting a curious contrast, as if the ice had just been taken from the oven. Fire cake, I've heard of this, I don't know what it is. The recipe for fire cake included water, flour, and not a single other thing. If that doesn't sound too appetizing to you, well, it didn't to revolutionary soldiers either. In truth, oh, it's like camp bread. We used to do it on a stick. We used to put it on a stick and then cook it over the fire. Fire cake, okay. when they absolutely had to. However, ration shortages during George Washington's winter at Valley Forge meant that many soldiers had no other option. Yeah. To make it, they would mix their flour rations with water and then bake it in an iron kettle. Since there was no yeast involved, the cake was dense and basically tasteless. But if that sounds boring, there was a way it got spiced up. Maggots and weevils regularly got into the flour stores. Since there was basically Protein. nothing that could be done about it, the men would simply cook them up with the flour. Well, at least it added some protein added to the meal. If you've never had it, anyone from Philly can tell you how good this meat concoction can be. Popularized by the Pennsylvania Dutch, Scrapple was made from the leftover parts of a pig. That's right, it's the American Revolutionary version of the McRib. One recipe that dates all the way back to the colonial period called for using the pig's head, feet, and any pieces which may be left after having made sausage meat. Is anyone else's mouth watering? The parts were to be I'm tossed into it. a pot with salt and boiled until they were soft enough to allow for removal of the bones. Americans were in the habit of seasoning the meat with salt and pepper and adding Indian meal to thicken the mixture into something closer to a mush. After it was cooked, the chef was to slice the scrapple and then fry it in hot lard. Scrapple, made from the best stuff on earth. Bits of the best stuff. Pumpkins were a new world food and Americans of the Revolutionary Era had several ways of incorporating them into their cooking. One of the most popular was a way that remains widely beloved today, pumpkin pie. In Hannah Glasses, a four- I've never tried pumpkin pie. Now, I hope I don't get as much grief as I had for not trying tortillas or anything like that before, but I've never tried it. I've never tried it. For mentioned cookbook of 1805, she carefully explains how the founding fathers made nice, and like ate dense. their own pumpkin pie. According to Glass, the cook should peel a pumpkin and stew it until it gets soft. The recipe then called for one pint of pumpkin one glass of rose water, one pint of milk, and one glass of Malaga wine. After that, wow. the recipe was rounded off with half a pound of butter, sugar, salt, seven eggs, and a dash of nutmeg. Like most people, George Washington... I've got to say, nothing is standing out as particularly disturbing, isn't it? Like, you would think during the wartime they'd have to eat all sorts of weird things. I mean, that... That flour thing with the maggots. I mean, the maggots would probably put me off a little bit. But anyway, if I'm starving, I'm going to eat me some maggots. And enjoy a drink from time delights. to time. And just months after the Revolutionary War began, George Washington stocked up on Madeira wine. 
This particular wine was imported from the Portuguese colony of Madeira and might contain brandy or other sweeteners, depending on the variety. Mm. In preparation for what he knew would be an extended conflict, Washington ordered 1900 bottles of the stuff. He wasn't the only founding father who was fond of the stuff either. In 1760, simple. John Hancock underreported his Madeira wine imports to protest British import taxes, which led to a mob in Boston. The delegates to the First Continental Congress drank Madeira while debating independence, and Thomas Jefferson raised a glass of Madeira right after signing the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Oh yes, coffee. I love coffee. Well, they did. Coffee is my biggest guilty pleasure. I don't drink a lot of alcohol. I mean, after a couple of weeks ago, I haven't had another beer or anything since. Um, and yeah, I'm just not a big drinker, but coffee is my downfall. I drink so much coffee, not Starbucks or anything like that. Do you know what I have been drinking? I've reacted to a video, Cowboy Coffee. I actually made Cowboy co Coffee a few times and it's with his tips, it's turned out freaking awesome. So thanks, Ken. We didn't have a Starbucks on every corner quite yet. Coffee was wildly popular during the American Revolution. I love coffee. In fact, when a merchant named Thomas Boylston drove up the price of coffee by stockpiling it, at least a hundred women marched to his warehouse and rioted. I the would riot took place on July 24th, 1777. According to Abigail Adams, at least 100 women assembled with a cart and trucks marched down to the warehouse and demanded the keys, which Boylston refused to deliver. That is when things took an ugly, aggressive turn. Hey, you Not missed my caffeine. Coffee. Adams reports one of the women seized him by his neck and tossed him into a cart. With no way to escape, he handed over the keys. They tipped the cart over to free him and then opened the warehouse. The coffee was removed, loaded into trucks, and then taken away. That all seems pretty reasonable to a coffee drinker. Should be expected. Unless you're Oprah, bread might not sound too exciting to you. But to the starving Continental <laughs> Forces of 1777, it was a lifesaver. The troops stuck in Valley Forge had requested more food, Ooh, but instead Congress sent them a brutal. baker named Christopher Ludwig. Ludwig wasn't just any old baker, though. In fact, his actual title was Superintendent of Bakers and Director of Baking in the Grand Army of the United States. Which, I have to admit, is the best. Stick down in the comments one thing you would never eat. Ever, ever. Uh, not if you were starving. If you were starving, I understand you could eat anything. But like if someone, were, if you were to visit a country or a friend's house or something and they offered you something on a plate, what is the one thing that you will not put in your mouth? You will not eat. I think the only thing I can think of is like a dog. Um, <laughs> and that's just because I love dogs and they, I couldn't, if I can't kill it, I'm not going to eat it. Um... And I don't mean like I have to be able to, I have to kill my own food. But if like we've got some animals here and I've slaughtered pigs and cows and things and I've hunted them in the past. If I'm not able to kill it myself, like mentally, or I think it's going to be too hard, then I don't think I could eat it. If I was starving though, your fluffy dog is, <laughs> he's looking delicious. Best LinkedIn title ever. If I was going to Congress die. Congress offered Ludwig a deal all, like, in which he would bake one pound resort. of bread per pound of flour. And this would allow him to sell some excess flour and pocket the money. However, Ludwig refused. He told Congress he had enough money and he had no desire to grow richer from a conflict. Instead, hmm. he insisted that he would furnish 135 pounds of bread for every 100 pounds of flour you put into my hands. A very classy move. Oh. Made from fermented molasses, which is a byproduct of Caribbean sugar plantations, rum has a very long history in the Americas. At first, it was shipped to the British colonies by the gallon, but by the time of the American Revolution, the colonists were distilling their own. New England alone had over 150 rum distilleries. Hmm. Revolutionary Americans loved rum so much that at the time of the war... <laughs> Look at the expressions, the guy in the middle and that. I know it's just a drawing, but it's brilliant. was as high as an astonishing four gallons per person, per year. Holy smokes. Being, for the most part, former Brits, the American colonists enjoyed many British foods. However, they also had no opposition to adopting new foods that were wait. grown in North America. In fact, Hannah Glass even included several recipes in her cookbook, which she described as adapted to the American mode of cooking. One of these recipes was for cranberry tarts. Glass's recommendation was to stew the cranberries into a jelly, add brown sugar, and then bake with butter and flour. 
Like most soldiers in wartime, the American forces that fought in the Revolution received daily rations to sustain themselves. The rations typically included a pound of meat per day, which might be beef, salt pork, or salt fish. Each soldier also received a pound of flour per day. In addition to those, the troops would get some helping of peas or beans, some milk, and usually a small quantity of rice, corn, and molasses. However, that was under ideal circumstances, and war is often less than ideal. In fact, the troops often didn't receive full rations, and when they were on the march, fresh milk was especially hard to find. During the long winter of 1777 in Valley Forge, many of the allowances had to be adjusted based on limited availability, and many soldiers just had to go without. Hmm. Tea? Given that they were mostly British, the Americans in the colonies had a special fondness for tea. When Parliament cracked down on tea smugglers, the colonists didn't take it too well. They tossed their tea into Boston Harbor at an event that would forever be called the Boston Tea Party. Once the revolution started, however, many Americans began to reject the idea of drinking British tea as a matter of patriotism. Moreover, British loyalists who continued to enjoy the drink would often face criticism from their more revolutionary neighbors, which probably didn't help sales too much. <laughs> many of the Americans who swore off drinking tea took to drinking coffee instead, yes. but some replaced it with raspberry leaf tea or other American-grown herbal tea no, alternatives. Have coffee. The Americans weren't just revolutionaries, they were trendsetters. Just a few years after the former English colonists won their own independence, their allies over in France staged a little revolution of their own. In Boston, the French Revolution was celebrated with a feast. They hung a sign reading, Peace Offering to Liberty and Equality, around the neck of an ox, and then led the animal to Liberty Square. There, the ox was carved up and served alongside turkey, punch, and 1,600 loaves of bread. Long live the revolution indeed. So what do you think? Which of the- I'm surprised by a few of those. I was expecting, I don't know. It seemed like they showed quite a few foods that the, no, I wouldn't, maybe the upper classes would eat. I'd love to know more of what the actual soldiers were eating when they didn't get their rations. That, that was what I was expecting with this video. Um, but yeah, it's still pretty interesting. None of the foods there really looked disgusting or horrible a lot of alcohol going around i suppose that's normal everywhere but yeah the food didn't look too bad well, i thought it would, i would probably eat everything that was on there anyway thanks so much for watching guys i hope you have an amazing rest of your day nearly tuesday so monday will get out of our way soon have an amazing rest of your day and i'll see you in the next video peace